Hi everyone, Jill here. Welcome back to Whispering Willow Farm. Today we're gonna talk about a subject that I think many of you guys are probably doing some deep diving in right now, and that is seed starting one-on-one. -on -one. How and why we grow from seed. Um, I'm gonna be talking a lot in this video, giving you an overview of some of the pros and cons, why we do it, why it might be uh, something you want to do. However, there will be certain things that I cover in this video that I will go into a more depth on in later videos in the coming weeks and some of them I've actually already shot and done and so I'll make sure to let you guys um, know where you can reference those videos or pause and let you know those videos that I'm going to further explain and this is just kind of an overview on all of those. But before we dive into this topic, uh, I wouldn't be doing a true Jill video if I did not pause and give you guys a little bit of encouragement on the front end. I mean, I feel like this is really important because I think back to when I started my first garden from seed. You guys, I was terrified. <laughs> I had no idea what I was doing. I'm pretty sure I went to Lowe's to buy my seed along with some crummy soil, and I had no idea what I was doing. I was terrified that I was going to fail, but I just had this yearning of wanting to grow food from seed. Um, and I'm here to tell you and encourage you guys, it's not rocket science. You literally can buy some seeds, even some crummy soil, which I don't recommend, but you can do it. You can plant your seed and it will produce food. And so be encouraged by that. And also know that I am teaching you guys um, having had 10 years of experience in this, okay? And so you cannot expect to start on this journey and be an expert. Um, if you are, that's great. <laughs> you should be teaching people. Uh, but more than likely, when you first learn to ride a bike, you don't immediately hop on that bike and you're an expert and you're you know doing races, right? You're gonna fall off a few times. You're gonna get a couple bumps and scrapes along the way, but then over time, you're gonna know how to ride that bike well. Uh, you're going to be able to do it with your eyes closed. You're going to know you know, how to turn the steering wheel and how to move those pedals. And it's the same when it comes to seed starting. It's going to be intimidating. There are going to be a few bumps and bruises along the way. Um, or in this case, you're probably going to have a few dead plants along the way. But that's okay because the more that you start doing it and the more you start learning and educating yourself, you're going to be able to start seeds with your eyes closed. And you're going to be able to teach other people and encourage other people um, you know, to seed start. So just go into this knowing that you don't have to be an expert on the first year. It might be year two, year three, it might even be year five before you feel really comfortable with the ins and the outs. But don't let that prevent you from getting on the bike. Don't let that prevent you from buying those seeds and starting because the only way you're going to get better at something is by one, doing, and by two, welcoming failure and not being fearful of it. Um, there's one thing, you know, on not wanting to continuously fail, but if you welcome failure and you learn from that, then I say then that was a risk worth taking all day long. And so I just want to encourage you guys with that on the front end, you can do this. You can grow food from seed and I'm going to teach you how to do it. All right, now that I've encouraged you all <laughs> that you are capable, let's talk about why you might want to start from seed. Um, this is actually a question I get asked often. Well, why would I start from seed? I could just go and buy transplants. I mean, you totally could do that. We'll talk about it more in a second. But one of the biggest reasons why you would want to start and grow from seed is that you get a jump start on your growing season. Um, and for someone like me who is growing year round and who is also growing to sell, this is crucial to the success of my farm. So let's kind of back up a second. There's three different ways you can go about growing a garden, all right? You can start from seed, which we're going to talk about the overview there. You can buy transplants from a box store, a nursery. Maybe your area has a plant sale where you're able to find uh, a few more unique varieties, all right? Or you can direct seed. So starting from seed, we're going to talk about what you need to do that. Um, buying transplants, obviously you're sourcing that out. We'll talk about the pros and cons that would come from doing that. And then direct seeding, you are essentially just waiting until your estimated last frost, you're clear of your last frost. You're gonna take that seed, you're gonna go outside, you're gonna plant it, you're gonna cover it up with some soil, you're gonna water it, you're gonna make sure it has adequate sunlight for its needs, and then that's it. And so you may be watching this video and think, well, why wouldn't I do that? That is obviously the easiest option out of all the ones that you've already mentioned without even going into depth. And yes, it is 
literally the most straightforward option. But the downfall of that is, let's say you live in a northern climate and you've got a super short growing window. Fortunately, I'm in central Arkansas, zone 7B, so we have a pretty long growing season. But I struggle with spring brassicas. Let's use Brussels sprouts, for instance. Brussels sprouts are 120 days to maturity. So if I were to wait until my estimated last frost was cleared, which would be the 1st of April, and I go and I sow out, you know, I direct seed this Brussels sprout, and it takes 120 days to mature. The truth is, we don't have springs here. I mean, we go from winter to summer in a blink of an eye. So what has happened in the past is that that Brussels sprouts or various, um, you know, brassicas, say cabbage, cauliflower, things like that, they begin to bolt before they even produce a head because it's too hot for them in my area. So if I didn't start from seed earlier and transplant out to ensure yield before it gets too hot, then I forfeit growing spring brassicas. And if you are in a northern climate and you have a very short window, by the time you direct seed that and it is you know days to maturity, you may have a very little harvest or you may even not have a harvest depending on the variety it is that you're growing. So by by starting your seeds inside, you're getting a jump start. You have got this beautiful mature transplant that has spent weeks in your greenhouse or your house growing. So when you transplant them out into your gardens, you're just ensuring a yield faster and quicker and more of a yield, especially if you're in those you know growing zones where you just don't have a large window. Um, also, if you're wanting to utilize year-round gardening, I have to continuously be sowing seeds in the greenhouse and transplanting out. Here where I live, again, a lot of this is dependent on accessibility to you, but we live in a very rural place in Arkansas. So I have plant starts available to me uh, around you know spring and into early summer. There are no starts available in the fall. There's no starts available in the winter. So if I wanna just you know continue to grow food for my family and to sell year round, the only way that I have access to that uh, is by starting the seeds myself because you cannot go out and buy plant starts other than that spring and summer season. And so this is another thing that you'll just wanna consider um, whenever you're thinking through is you know starting from seeds something that I want to do. Now, something I want to express to you too, you can start from seed and direct seed. So for instance, we direct seed most of our beans. They're around 50, 55 days to maturity. It doesn't make a lot of sense for me to start those inside and use up greenhouse space and then transplant them out because they do great. And it's such a short window of days to maturity that I actually get to do a couple successions of beans, right? And so, you know, that ensures that I can direct seed that bean and in 55 days I will start harvesting uh, the beans from that plant. But some of those longer varieties like tomatoes and peppers, the brassicas I was just talking about, if you wait, you know, to put those things out and direct seed them, you're going to have, you're going to just shorten your window of harvest on them. And so things like our tomatoes, our peppers, our brassicas, our lettuce rotation, we are starting all of these and then just transplanting them out. So let's say, you know, I am starting my tomatoes uh, 10 weeks before my estimated last frost. I'm able to start those seeds in my greenhouse, transplant them outside, and I've got a 10 week head start. You guys, this might be crucial to you being able to grow food for your family or not, depending on where you are living. But that doesn't mean that you have to start everything from seed. Figure out those short days to maturity varieties that you wanna grow. Figure out the things that only do best direct seeded. So all of our root crops, we are direct seeding our beets, our radishes, our carrots, our parsnips, our rutabagas. There's a lot of things that you can direct seed and eliminate you know, the stress of needing those. And if you are in those climates where it does get colder, you can leave a lot of these things in your ground and just have your, your ground you know, and your bed be your uh, cold storage for a lot of these root vegetables, which is actually something I prefer uh, to do as well. So you don't have to start everything from seed. Figure out your plan, what you're wanting to grow, what makes the most sense to grow. But one of the biggest reasons why you would want to start from seed 
is that you are going to get a jump start on your season and you are going to ensure yield and more yield at that, um, you know, by the end of the season. All right, so aside from getting a jump start on your season, depending on some of your goals for my family, we are modeling a small scale intensive farm. We're actually transitioning into growing food again, which is super exciting. But with that, I can't gamble uh, the loss of a crop, right? And so let's say I have got a 40 foot bed that I am planting with lettuce production. And let's say I direct seed this really dense grid for lettuce. And maybe I had 10 of those that didn't uh, germinate and they just didn't produce. Well, instead of having a 40 foot bed and transplanting only the highest, best quality of those crops to ensure profit and yield for my family, I now have these gaps where seeds just didn't come back up. I'm having to go back in and reseed, which means I'm not going to be harvesting at the same time, which means they're not going to be, you know, maturing at the same time, which means I can't sell all this bed that I've already allotted to a customer. So I'm losing money. And unfortunately, we're just not in a position where you can lose money. So when you're starting your seeds, especially if you're wanting to, you know, sell food, I'm ensuring that only the best of the best make their way out into the garden, right? When we do our sunflowers, we get asked a lot, why do you not just direct seed your sunflowers? Isn't that so much more time intensive to start them? But it's not because I'm ensuring that only the best sunflowers are going out into the field on that grid because we do make a high dollar per stem on sunflowers versus if I were to direct seed my grid, 10 of those didn't come up. Not only have I not efficiently planted that grid, I'm not getting you know as much yield or dollar per grid that I could um, versus if I started them inside and only transplanted out the best. So that's something to be mindful of. If you are only direct seeding your garden, which is totally doable, you might have to go back in and keep reseeding things. Um, and those are just going to take longer. The more you have to reseed them, the longer it's going to be for you to get your harvest. And so that's just a few things that you might want to consider as well. So another reason you might want to start from seed is that it's more cost effective. Now, don't get me wrong, <laughs> you can totally be that hobbyist that gets just engulfed with heirlooms and you want to overbuy on seeds. You might think you need the latest and greatest seed starting materials and equipment uh, to get started. Now, I'm gonna be doing an in-depth video on my must-have seed starting supplies and you'd be surprised. We don't have a lot to be efficient on our farm, but what we have serves a purpose. A lot of what we have is multi-purpose, which is how we're able to reduce cost. But if you have a plan, which I'm going to encourage you to have a plan, trust me, if you do not go into your gardening season with a plan and a strategy, you're going to waste your time and your money. Um, and no one wants to do that. No one wants to grow food and realize at the end of the season, they only yielded half of what they really could have because they didn't go in with a clear plan and strategy. Now that's not to say you can't pivot and alter from that plan and strategy, but you can't just go in without a plan. It's never going to yield in the best success that it could. Um, and so if you have a plan and you have a budget, you can get buy with growing seed way cheaper than you can buying transplants. For instance, I went to a box store this past year for an organic tomato plant that was about this big. Honestly, it only had maybe a couple sets of true leaves, super puny. It was like $8 and some change. You guys, I can buy over a hundred organic tomato seeds for around five bucks. So why on earth would I buy one little puny plant for $8 when I could buy an entire pack that would yield me a hundred plants, which would produce thousands of pounds of tomatoes. Now let's say you really are wanting to come at this from that uh, frugal standpoint and you're just wanting a small garden. You just want to provide for your, for your family. Find some friends or some family members who also just want a small garden. Go in together. Split the seed. Are you really going to plant 100 tomato seeds? No. So then go in and split the seed. Buy bulk soil. Split the soil with someone else. And then you've even reduced your costs you know, more by, by being able to do that. I remember in my beginning years, we did not have a lot of money and I was bootstrapping it. I would save red solo cups um, that we'd have for birthday parties. I was using recycled yogurt containers. There's a lot of ways that you can get by doing this on a budget. I would tell you to uh, consider, you know, all the things when you're going through that. If you do the red solo cups and the yogurt containers, there's certainly nothing wrong with that. That's going to eat up a lot of your space. If you are wanting to scale this, that is 
not a scalable option. And so if your goal in the beginning is, hey, I wanna sell some food, I wanna scale this, or I wanna max out my space for my family, go ahead and set yourself up with the right principles that you need. Maybe that's soil blocks, maybe that's some bootstrap farmer containers. I've had my same bootstrap trays for years and years. They're gonna withstand, they're gonna last well against all the elements, it's worth it for me. And so, Yes, there is a way that you can do this on a budget, but don't do that at the expense of efficiency, right? If it's not efficient and you don't have the space to house, you know, all these red solo cups and the space that it would need, don't grow in those. Buy something that's, you know, fits in a tray well and it takes up a small area because you may not be growing in a greenhouse. You may be utilizing trays in your house on racks and that might be shoved in a closet or maybe in a basement, spare room, whatever you have it. And so, you know, when you're thinking through your budget, you can still buy quality at budget if you have a plan. So one of the pros to starting from seed is that you're going to have ample amount of options. Now this can be really appealing to those of us who love those heirloom seeds, right? Um, I've mentioned a few times I'm in rural Arkansas. Uh, when I go to the local nurseries and the big box stores that are carrying plant starts every year, I might have a Cherokee purple available to me and I might have a cherry tomato, but it's very limited on the heirloom options that I have and most of the hybrid options are pretty generic as well and so when you're rummaging through catalogs you can grab the Baker Creek seed catalog and there's hundreds of different varieties of tomatoes that have different colors and textures and flavors they come in different shapes and sizes and you're just gonna have access to more things that I couldn't even go in my grocery store and buy to cook I'm now able to grow from seed and experience something that otherwise I would not have access to that captivates me right that that grabs my interest it's a reason I want to grow from, from seed. Um, we do a lot of high tunnel production. I need the best varieties that are for greenhouse production. I'm going to Johnny Seeds and I'm buying those and I'm yielding 100 pounds of tomatoes every single week. And so there are just going to be so many more options available to you if you buy from seed versus uh, being limited to what you have at a nursery or a store. Again, this is really dependent on where you live. I know I have a friend in California who has some wonderful nurseries with a lot of options but for me we just don't have those here <laughs> we just do not have access to that and so really the only way I'm going to be able to grow those things experience them in the kitchen and offer them to my customers is if I just grow them myself all right so a quick overview of what we just talked about of why you might want to start seeds you're going to get a jump start on your season and be able to extend your season into year-round growing um, by having access to start your own seeds um, it's also going to be more cost effective uh, to start your your own things versus buying all your transplants, especially if you are growing a large space. Um, and also just the diverse um, options that you have available to you for heirlooms and hybrids. So now that we know why you might want to start your own seeds, let's talk about what you need to start your own things. Now I will have a very detailed video on my, you know, essential must have seed starting supplies, but it's not a long list. You guys, I've spent many years buying different things that I've kind of honed in on the things that are must have and the things you don't need. Uh, but one, you are going to need to identify where you plan on starting these seeds. Do you have access to a greenhouse or are you going to be starting them inside? If you're starting them inside, you're going to need some sort of rack. I will find some and list it. You're also going to need grow lights and heat mats. If you are growing them out in a greenhouse, you probably are not going to need any grow lights. And depending on you know your zone and climate, um, heat mats can be optional. But you're going to need the seeds that you're starting. You're going to need a, a quality soil mix. Do not skimp and buy that cheap soil mix, you guys. You can even make your own recipe. Um, so seeds, soil, a rack, grow lights, heat mats if you're growing indoors, or a greenhouse if you're growing outside. You're also going to need to determine what you are starting them in. Are you starting them in soil blocks? Do you have them in the bootstrap trays? Um, I'm going to provide some links down for you guys so you can evaluate and be thinking about what's going to work best. Or are you going to be using some recycling? Recycled materials that you have laying around your house. Again, you're going to need to evaluate your goals, set yourself up for the best success. Um, and then I think that once you kind of know those goals, you can pivot and figure out where you're going to buy your supplies from. Another thing that is crucial to starting seed is knowing when your estimated last frost is. Now we touched on this earlier in the video when we were talking about direct seeding, um, but this is something you have to know. It's a non-negotiable, right? Uh, you can go to the farmer's almanac, which is what I do to determine my estimated last frost, but y'all don't be married by this. It said that my 
estimated last frost was the end of March. Now, I know better. Uh, we've got that, you know, late spring frost that comes and gets us every year. So I am not sowing my things outside at the end of March. There, there's not a chance that I'm doing that. So it's important to make sure you're checking your 10-day forecast and also just knowing what your weather typically does, okay? And so give yourself more grace. So if it, you know, I usually always wait at least a week, a week and a half after that estimated last frost has passed before I transplant things outside. Nothing is more devastating than spending weeks and weeks setting yourself up for success, having beautiful plant babies, and then transplanting them out prematurely just for them to get nipped by Jack Frost. Trust me, I've been there, I've done that, and I wanna save you from you know feeling that heartache. Don't do it, don't do it. And most of these things are gonna grow better when it gets hotter anyways, so there's very little advantage from getting it out sooner um, because you have to make sure that you've hardened it off properly. You don't want it to experience transplant shock if it's in that cozy environment in your house or your greenhouse and then moved outside and it drastically gets low. So just make sure you know your estimated last frost, make sure you're checking that 10 day forecast to know when you are clear to actually direct seed or transplant out your little babies. Another thing I'll mention is depending on the space you have available, that's going to also be dependent on um, the supplies that you need. Now, if you have a bunch of space, maybe those, you know, solo cups would work for you. But we're growing thousands of plants here in a rather small seed starting tunnel. So, you know, I'm using those two and a half inch pots from Bootstrap Farmer and I'm using the soil blockers and up potting them because it's saving me so much space. So say you only have one of those racks um, to utilize in your house. Maybe a soil block is an investment just because of the space it's gonna save you and you're able to actually grow more, but you're not needing more space to do that. So evaluate the space that you have to designate to seed starting and the space that you're wanting to plant out in your garden as well. All right, so I know I threw a lot of information out at you guys, but in my book, The Tiny But Mighty Farm, I have got an entire chapter on growing from seed. I give you a seed starting guide, a step-by-step. -step. I talk about my favorite hybrids and heirloom varieties, different containers that I'm using, different supplies that you need, whether you're direct seeding, learning to grow with the seed, I even talk about how we track seed sowing. And so if you want a reference guide and you want a start to finish on soil blocks, on everything you need for seed starting, um, make sure that you snag my book. It'll be listed down below. This will be a great reference for you to have as you start seed and even just talk about the importance of starting and growing from seed. So I hope this seed starting one-on-one -on -one was helpful for you guys. It was an overview of why you might be interested in starting seeds and some of the things you might need to be successful. Successful. Just remember, you can start your seeds, you can buy transplants, or you can direct seed. They're all good options, but they're all going to come at different costs, and they're all going to have pros and cons to them. So I hope you found something in this video that you identified with and that you thought, okay, I can do this. But a very important takeaway I hope that you got from this is feeling encouraged that you can grow from seed. Now, this doesn't mean you start your entire garden from seed. Maybe you say, I'm going to grow five tomatoes, five peppers, and five five cucumbers from seed, and I'm gonna source the rest out from wherever I've bought my transplants from uh, in the years past. That's a great option because you're giving yourself the freedom to learn um, and to maybe even fail and mess up a little bit, but then you can still guarantee you'll have yield from the plants that you bought. And so give yourself grace in that, but 1000% know that you can grow from seed. I hope this answered some of those questions. If you guys have any more questions about seed starting, how and why we do it, please leave a comment down below and in the description, you can find all of the links for the things that I referenced today. But thank you guys for hanging out with me. I'll talk to you soon.